Hello and welcome to yet another video. This is the sixth episode of the story, and when Naruto's father met his mother, his first thought was that a village out there must be missing its idiot. This story is from Silvershine, please support him, her. Please like and subscribe to show your support. Let's get the show started. Minato had never been inside a laboratory before, but he quickly understood that they were not pleasant places, or at least the ones run by creepy androgynous geniuses weren't. He looked around the badly lit room, every blind drawn, and only half the dull orange fluorescent tubes working above them. Most light appeared to be coming from a strangely smoking glass of noxious green on the middle workbench, confirming everything Minato had ever suspected about mad scientists. Granted, everything else looked pretty mundane. A cage of rats. Stacks of paperwork and research notes. One partially dissected monkey. Its little brown paw that so closely resembled a human hand had slipped off its tray to point at the floor. It reminded Minato of another place, at the edge of the water country, where it had been human corpses lining the tables and walls. That memory was a dulled one. It no longer made his stomach clench the way it used to, but whether he realized it consciously or not, Minato raised his guard. He couldn't be at ease in this place, nor around this man. Have you ever been interested in science? Orochimaru asked huskily, sliding past him to tap a long, elegant finger against a set of beakers contained some sort of current experimentation. It's all right, Minato said with muted enthusiasm. He'd been top of the class in science, but then he'd been top in everything. It didn't translate into any particular interest. Botany was okay. Indeed? Orochimaru smirked. Did you know there are species of plants that are as close to immortal beings as any life form on this planet? Once established they can live forever. Minato begged to differ. The last time Kushina had gone away she'd left him in charge of all the houseplants. Minato had dutifully watered them every day, and in turn each and every one had dutifully shriveled up and died. Still, the damn knotweed in the garden would probably outlive them both. What was it you needed helping with? Minato asked, hoping to steer the Sanin back to the matter at hand. The sooner it was done, the sooner Minato could return to the world of the living. Of course, of course. This must be the Kandu spirit everyone talks about. Not a challenge exists you won't charge headfirst into, Orochimaru said, smiling gracefully. But it did not sound like a compliment. So tell me, did it bother you that the Hokage handed your mission to me? Minato remained perfectly schooled. It bothered him, sure, but had a highly respected Sanin really just brought him down to his lab to rub it in his face? I'm sure your skills were better suited to the task, he said, which was a reassurance he'd been telling himself for weeks. Perhaps so, as I seem to have made a remarkable breakthrough. He really had come her to have his face rubbed in it. Minato's eyelids flicked fractionally lower. How nice, he deadpanned. Orochimaru tented his fingers together. They really were absurdly long. And perhaps now, in the spirit of sticking to our strengths, it is time to return it to your hands? What? He hadn't expected that. Now he was gaping, stunned, as Orochimaru glided across his lab to retrieve a scroll from another bench. It bore the official seal of the Hokage. Our man has been identified and unearthed, said Orochimaru as he handed the scroll to Minato. The bodies of the victims may never be recovered, but we can still find them justice, don't you think? His name is Kamina. He fled the village five hours ago when the Hokage issued an execution order. That very execution order now rested in Minato's palm. He looked at it carefully, then back at the San Nin. I don't understand. Isn't this your mission to complete? Unfortunately I am tied to my responsibilities to some very sensitive experiments, Orochimaru whispered. But I have been assured you have the swiftest, deadliest hand in your generation. I feel confident in leaving the conclusion of this matter to you." Minato was still skeptical. 
Since when were ninja too busy doing experiments to serve the village? You need a lab assistant, he said. With a chuckle, Orochimaru tilted his head. Perhaps I'll get one, one day. He said, but until then I'm sure you wouldn't mind. This way you will have the credit you deserve after all you did to track this man down. Isn't that better? Minato sensed an appeal to his vanity there. But the credit for stopping this man had never been his priority. It had only ever been his confidence in himself that had been shaken, not his pride. Even so, this was just as much of a chance to prove to himself he wasn't so obsolete. As you wish, Minato said, tucking the scroll into his pocket. I'll arrange a team as soon as possible. Excellent, Orochimaru said, sliding past him again, rather too close for comfort. And in return I might be able to do you a favor also? How do you mean? Minato was hesitant. Owing or receiving favors from anyone like Orochimaru left a bad taste in his mouth. Haven't you always wondered who your father was? A true shiver crept up Minato's spine. This seemed far too much like a prelude to one of those, I am your father revelations that occurred far too frequently in Kushina's tacky books. My father died. I buried him a few years ago, he said shortly. A mere civilian who had the honor of being married to such a phenomenal woman far beyond his league, Orochimaru said, flexing his fingers dismissively. Minato might not have liked or admired his father much, but even he considered this a little rude. You didn't really think you were fathered by such an uncivilized brute? You must have wondered who your real father was. I've never really thought about it, Minato said honestly. Are you saying you know my father? The Sanmin shook his head lightly, long, glossy hair swaying. I don't know the answer to that question, but we could solve that puzzle together if you are interested. Why would you want to? Minato wondered. Perhaps because it is a question that has intrigued a lot of people. You are one of most brilliant shinobi this village has produced in years, and although you no doubt owe a lot of this to Namike's Midoriko, one can't help but wonder if there isn't a little more pedigree about you than is immediately obvious. Would knowing change anything? It didn't seem a very important question to Minato, and if people were asking it, they ought to find better things to worry about than his parentage. Knowledge can be pursued for its own merit, Orochimaru instructed. And perhaps your father is still alive and eager to meet you? Isn't that worth finding out? With Minato's experience of parents, he was perfectly happy remaining an orphan, but it would be a lie to say he wasn't tempted to learn a name, or put a face to his other maker. How could you possibly find out, though, he asked. Because he was pretty sure this was knowledge his mother had taken to the grave. The answer, said Orochimaru, reaching out to grasp cold fingers around Minato's wrist, lies here. He managed not to recoil too strongly. The anwear lay in his wrist? It took him a moment to realize Orochimaru's fingertips were pressed hard against his pulse point. Minato could feel the blood thudding strongly under the pressure. A small sample of your blood is all I would need, said the San Nin, delicately tracing the vein up Minato's arm. Minato wondered if this was some kind of sexual assault. And what would you do with it? he asked stiffly. Thankfully, Orochimaru suddenly released him and swept to a door on the far side of the room. Minato followed cautiously, and found himself led into a room that resembled the ice cream section at the supermarket. Except instead of delicious milky treats, inside these floor-to-ceiling refrigerators were row upon row of blood vials. Almost everyone in Kanoha has a place in here, the Sanmin explained, leading him through the corridor of blood. The first Hokage, the second, the third, almost every single ninja who ever served here and shed blood here. Minato was transfixed. Is this legal? he found himself asking. You think the Hokage would allow it if it weren't? Orochimaru responded evasively. A blood bank is a rather useful thing, and as you can see, ours is rather thorough. He had stopped beside one particular fridge bearing the mark N1. Following his gaze, Minato saw one particular vial stashed away inside. 
It was labeled, Namikaze, Midoriko. That's my mother's blood, he cried. Why would you have it? She must have donated it, Orochimaru said, returning to his dismissive tone. I simply inherited this collection. And as you can see, between your blood and hers, it would be very possible to see if your blood matches anyone else in this room. Even if your father never gave a sample, it's more than likely someone related to him did, and there will be your answer. And if my father is a civilian? Or from? Another village entirely? Then you'll know at least. It was pretty clear that Orochimaru's interest would end if that turned out to be the case, so what did he care? And what happens to my blood? Minato asked. It gets stored here, along with everyone else's? What is this for? Do you think I plan to do something devious with it? Orochimaru asked lightly. Clone you perhaps? Splice your DNA with others to create supermen? Okay, that did sound a little stupid and paranoid. Minato sighed, glancing reluctantly to his mother's name. How strange that this was the only piece left of her. It was evidence that she had been real, not just an image in books and calendars that were as strange to him as any other long-dead Kunoichi pinup. I'll think about it, he said, and tapped the scroll he'd been given. First I have to get a team and catch this guy, Kamina. Of course, Orochimaru simpered. That was when Minato spotted another door behind him, one that was bolted shut and slightly rusted. What's in there, he nodded to it. The Sanin didn't mind others seeing the door or being this close to it. Only he could get through it and it was securely soundproofed. Even if it hadn't been, his subjects had stopped screaming weeks ago. That, he said, smiling widely, is where all the really exciting experiments happen. An assignment like this required a careful balance of players. To track a man who had half a day's head start that grew with every passing minute, he would need a damn good tracker. Unfortunate, Inazuka Tsum was already occupied on another mission, so Minato was left with a limited choice. And he had to admit that of all the Nin left in the village who specialized in tracking, AI was probably the best. So, with Jiraiya's words ringing in his ears about how teams were supposed to be like second families and comrades shouldn't just be disposed off like used tissues, Minato went off in search of AI as he supposed one might for a very estranged and distant cousin. And there he found her, collecting stray kunai from the bushes in the Genin training grounds. A mission, she repeated flatly, looking more closely at the kunai in her bucket than at Minato. Why me? You're a good tracker, he said. Oh, is that all? she muttered. Look, I need your help. If this guy gets away, he'll start killing again. He's a psycho. You need help? AI repeated again. Does this mean you're done being full of yourself? Was there any way to answer that question without damning himself? If you don't want to help, just say so. I can't afford to waste time here. What about Saburu? Shouldn't he come if you're so insistent on getting the old gang back together? Minato thought for a moment. Genjutsu could always come in handy, and Saburu was pretty proficient with it. Yes. Find him and tell him to meet at the gate in half an hour. He turned to leave. Wait, I haven't agreed to anything yet. AI shouted after him. Then I'm. Waiting, Minato said spreading his hands expectantly. AI kicked the dust, her bucket falling limply against her side. She knew she didn't have a lot of time to wring this out, and her frustration showed on her face. Fine, she hissed at last. But just this once. A three-man team was a perfectly competent cell on its own, but Minato didn't want to leave anything to chance. He wanted a fourth member, though the one person he had in mind might be even more reluctant than AI after their last encounter. Still, he resolved himself to find Kushina. Nothing ventured, nothing gained, even if all he could hope to gain was another lump on his head. And usually since the first place she went whenever she was mad at him was her sensei's house, Minato knew where to begin looking. 
Hataki Sakumo answered the door before Minato had even raised his hand to knock on it. He didn't look at all surprised. She's in the back, he muttered, don't tell her I let you in. Kushina had made her sensei cover for her so many times that they both knew the routine. Minato nodded his thanks and slipped past the older man, heading towards the family room at the back of the house. Sakumo, not wanting to be accused of aiding Minato, didn't follow. As he drew closer to the room, he heard voices, one high and sulky, the other low and soft and as pleasant on the ear as honey on the tongue. Everyone has to go to the academy, Kakashikan. You need your education. But I already passed the Genin exam. That doesn't mean you don't still have stuff to learn. What about maths and science and proper grammar and things? I know everything the big kids know. Okay. What's pie? It's, it's that thing what comes with apples in it. Yummy. But you can't quit the academy at your age. Even Minato had to do the full term. But he got given a teacher. So will you, I expect. Don't be so impatient, and don't pull on my hair. Sorry. Minato hung in the doorway, the polite cough he'd intended to make to announce his presence didn't come, because the moment he'd seen Kushina sitting in the middle of the floor, patiently fixing some kind of dog toy on wheels while Kakashi sat behind her, weaving her glorious shower of hair into experimental plates, his voice had died. There was as much of it as ever there was. She hadn't had her hair cut, after all. For some reason, Minato felt lightheaded with happiness. His shadow didn't go unnoticed, and suddenly Kushina turned to look at him. What are you smirking at? she demanded. Nothing, he said. It's just, your hair. Her posture didn't change exactly, but to Minato it had suddenly become defensive. What about it? It's... But Kushina wouldn't appreciate him pointing out she had gone with his suggestion, or rather, caved to his hysterical begging. She would take that as obnoxious gloating. It's, really red. You're welcome, she said with a sniff, and went back to her task of reattaching the dog's wheel. Kakashi, however, continued to stare quite openly at Minato with the uncanniness only mastered by those who had dedicated a lot of study to black and white horror films about possessed child actors. Actually, there was something I wanted to ask you, he said to Kushina. Mm hmm, she hummed flatly. I'm going on a mission, and I thought you might like to come. She swiveled to fix him with a beady, suspicious stare that rivaled Kakashi's. You what? I'm going on a mission and I thought you might like to, you never pick me for missions, she interrupted, more confused than annoyed. Well, you normally don't like my missions, he reminded her. His preference ran towards quick, clean termination missions, and Kushina, who had racked up a reputation for pacifism during the war, preferred the diplomatic kind of missions where you met new people and shook hands and left everyone alive with their limbs intact. Is this somehow different? she asked. Well, you said you'd like to get the guy with the sharp end of a hammer. I say that about a lot of people, said the girl thought to be a pacifist. You'll have to be more specific. The Babu Snatcher. Arg. Kushina suddenly jumped to her feet. The half-formed plate Kakashi had woven sprang loose like an explosion of fire. I hate that guy. When are we leaving? As soon as you can, great. Kushina dashed past him and out of the room, sliding across the polished floor to the foot of the stairs. Sensei. I'm borrowing your umbrella. That's fine, shouted his disembodied voice. Just put it back when you're done with it. Kushina reappeared triumphantly with the umbrella in hand, brandishing it like a warrior's halberd. The formidable steel tip was let down only by the pattern of cartoon rainbows on its white canvas. I'm ready, she declared. Do you need your equipment? he asked. We could be tracking this guy for a while. Patting her pouch, she said, Akunoichi is always ready and prepared, which somewhat belied how long this particularly Kunoichi took in the bathroom to do her hair and skin care regime every morning. After turning on the TV and steering Kakashi in front of it, 
they set off towards the gates, each feeling in extraordinary high spirits, Kushina, because she so rarely ever got an opportunity to show off her skills to Minato, and Minato, because Kushina was more stoked about this mission than any girl had ever been about a date with him. Even the news that AI was also on the team didn't seem to deter her. If I refused to work with everyone who didn't like me, I'd have way more time to weed my garden. It seemed quite a sad thing to say in Minato's opinion. He had never really understood why anyone would snub such a wonderful, intelligent, and beautiful, and he really needed to stop thinking like that if he was going to get through this mission. At the gates, Ai and Saburu were waiting. But whatever fragile peace Minato had managed to broker between them came perilously close to breaking again when AI laid eyes on Kushina beneath the bobbing shade of her umbrella. You've got to be kidding me, she said, loudly enough that even Kushina with her indomitable spirit wavered. Is there a problem? Minato asked pleasantly. AI would probably be far more useful for this mission than Kushina but he wasn't above dropping her back where he'd found her if she was going to antagonize Kushina like the old days. You're bringing your girlfriend? Seriously? AI's lip lifted in a faint sneer. Kushina isn't my girlfriend, Minato said, repeating something he'd been saying since he was ten. And I'd like you all to get along, please. AI shrugged indifferently, but she kept her distance from Kushina like she carried some contagious disease. Kushina didn't seem to care for her much either, but as long as it didn't interfere in the mission, Minato was confident they could at least cooperate until completion. He took out the scroll and passed around the photo of the target, some Chunin in his thirties who'd never gotten very far. Kushina commented it was odd that a Chunin could be responsible for all the attacks and had managed to evade not only the military police but some of the best Jonin in the village. AI who might not have disagreed if anyone else had pointed that out, quickly retorted that average nobodies were the most likely to commit such crimes. To which Kushina responded that she was a Chunin too and did not feel the need to kidnap and kill people, though she could speak for another Chunin like AI, who might have been talking from personal experience. Minato coughed. The investigation has already been completed, he reminded. We don't need to ask who or why. We have to catch this guy and bring him down before he falls off the radar and starts killing again. Kushina turned curiously to him. By, bring him down, you mean? We terminate him, he said, nodding. Is that necessary? Oh, here we go, smirked AI. So I'm not leaping for joy about killing someone I know nothing about, Kushina ground out, turning on AI. That doesn't make me a coward. No, not a coward, she said, they call you people, pacifists, these days, don't they? The hand clutching her umbrella tightened, and in that second Minato really believed Kushina was about to swing it at her. I may have made a mistake, he said reluctantly, giving Kushina an apologetic look, though she only blinked back in confusion. If you're not comfortable with the mission, you don't have to come. But Kushina was on the warpath now. One look at AI's smirking face and she turned red with angry determination. It's not a problem, she said in clipped tones. Though she was probably only saying that because AI was there. Minato looked uncertainly between their glaring, scowling faces and sighed. He'd miscalculated. To kick one or the other off the team now would be a disaster. Kushina would never forgive him. AI would certainly. Be glad never to look at him again. Why did women have to be so difficult? No wonder Jiraiya couldn't write good female characters, anticipating their reactions was a science not easily mastered. Some of this was totally beyond his comprehension. Well, said Minato, edging slightly more toward Saburu's much more predictable and reassuring bulk. This guy Kamina fled the village through these gates about six hours ago. The trail won't have gone cold yet. A.I. Shoe size, she asked shortly. 10. A.I. walked back and forth beneath the gate, staring hard at the tracks in the dry, sandy ground, giving Kushina and her umbrella a wide berth. They were all trained to track this way, 
but AI had perfected tracking to her own particular art form. Jiraiya had always said that she was a hunter neen just waiting to happen. Size tens, heading towards the forest, I announced, pointing a finger towards the tree lean. A few hours old. Definitely running. Minato nodded once. Let's go. They set off at a flying speed, Ai taking up the lead with her eyes glued to the ground. She never once needed to pause and never lost sight of the tracks. Her prickly personality was a small price to pay for such a swift trek, and at this rate they might just catch up with their target before the day was out. He looked back at Kushina to make sure she was keeping up. She met his gaze coolly, then stuck out her tongue. He snorted with laughter, causing Ai to shoot a charred look at him over her shoulder. A straightforward path through the forest was unusual for someone on the run who probably didn't want to be followed. There were no attempts to cover the tracks or lay decoy marks or double back. It made Minato wonder if the guy they were following was so good as to have fooled even AI, or if he was a moron who didn't know any academy-level techniques to hide a trail. At least AI was sure she was right. These are real tracks, she said. And they're fresher. He's slowed down so we could catch up to him soon. Good. Then this will be over once and for all, Minato said. Maybe you should have brought Ren along, Kushina said. This was his mission too, right? Oh, I'm sure he's busy doing his own thing. It wasn't like Minato had even thought to check. Besides, he only teamed up because the Hokage said so. And he didn't say so this time, she asked flatly. Well, the Hokage didn't give me the mission this time, he said. It was Orochimaru. That snake? AI scoffed. Creeps the hell out of me. The mission is from him? Kushina sounded uncertain. I thought only the Hokage could give execution orders against Kanoha citizens? Minato shrugged. The Hokage approved it. The scrolls got his seal on it. As far as he was concerned, that was all that was required. Kushina still looked a little perturbed, but her question subsided and she sank into scowling concentration. The day was getting hotter, and as they left the cover of the forest to cross thousands of acres of rice paddies, it was taking its toll a little on Kushina who had never coped well with heat. Perhaps growing up in the cooler climate of the Whirlpool village had been bad training for a life in the humid countryside around Kanoha. It was one of the things about her that drew scorn. Even now AI was glancing smugly over her shoulder at Kushina's lagging form and putting on a spurt of extra speed to widen the distance. By the time Kushina's cheeks had turned quite a strong pink, Minato called for a break. I need a drink, he said, and he removed his flask to take one sip of his water before handing the entire thing over to Kushina. She took it gratefully enough, but made quite a show of wiping any trace of his spit off the flask's neck before she would drink from it. Then she tipped the bottle back and downed all its contents. Sabura drank too, which might have been a show of moral support for Kushina, since AI refused to take any sustenance. Instead, she had decided to stand as rigid as possible at the head of the group, arms folded in a defiant display that said the only thing she needed was to keep moving. After he was sure Kushina was as well watered as any of her garden begonias, Minato gave the signal to move on again. Towards late afternoon, the trail began to slow. They were approaching a small town nestled between two ugly lumps of cliff, and at this natural bottleneck in the landscape the traffic was increasing. AI was having trouble following their target's tracks. When they finally entered the town and stepped onto hardened concrete paving, the trail was lost entirely. It's okay, he reassured AI, who was looking severely miffed. If he went through here there may be some witnesses. They began asking around, which was a little more difficult than anticipated since many of the people who saw them coming always seemed to suddenly realize they were needed elsewhere. The ones they managed to corner were all terse in their denials that they had seen any other shinobi come through the town. It was normal for civilians outside the hidden villages to be wary of ninja, 
but Minato wondered why he was drawing the most furtive looks when someone like Saburu was far more intimidating to see. What's going on? he murmured to Kushina, after the tenth old lady shuffled back into her house and shut the door when she saw him approaching. I suppose the problem with cultivating a fearsome reputation like the yellow flash is that it's not just your enemies who fear you, she responded mildly. That can't be it, he sighed. I've never been here before. How would they know what the yellow flash looks like? They don't, she said simply. Every blonde guy in a Kanoha uniform is riding on your coattails right now, you know. You should hear Inoichi go on about how often he's mistaken for you. It's gone to his head so much, I think he really believes he was the one who took down General Akuse sometimes. Minato folded. His arms. Huh. They traipsed further through the town. While AI scoured the ground for familiar tracks, Saburu somberly flashed Kamina's picture to everyone they passed. Minato walked in his considerable shadow where he might be less noticeable, and Kushina brought up the rear, looking around anxiously at the people and their houses and their little gardens. The troubled expression she'd worn since he'd announced the exact nature of this mission had never left her face, and she grew more restless as they moved. The victims, she said eventually. What happened to them? Minato hesitated before answering. Dead, he said, voice heavy. They're all dead. Even, even the children, she whispered. He nodded. Orochimaru found their bodies then, she asked. No, he said slowly, trying to remember what Orochimaru had told him exactly. The Sanin had been pretty vague. I don't think the bodies were recovered. I'm not sure they can be recovered. Kushina said nothing. When he looked back at her, her face shone pale beneath the shade of her umbrella. That's horrible, she said quietly. That's. Over here. A.I. was standing next to a man in a broad straw hat, waving at them. This guy says he saw a Kanoha shinobi heading that way. The trail was on again. Following the man's directions, they headed along a narrow street that ran directly beneath the northern cliff face. The ground was softer there. A.I. reckoned she had picked up their target's tracks again, though by the time they came out on the far side of the town, the tracks had once more vanished. The team came to a stop again, looking around a little uselessly. More of them. Seen more ninja today than I've seen in my life, I have. Minato spun to the source of the voice, a middle-aged woman sitting outside her shop with a friend, fanning her face and looking as curiously at him as he looked at her. Excuse me, he called, jogging over, have you seen any other ninja from Kanoha today? As it happens, she said, pointing beyond a distant house surrounded by a neat square of uniform trees. Saw your friend going up the hill towards the orchard a little while ago. Kana here just came that way. Said he was still there when she saw him, and that were half an hour ago. The rest of his team were already off and running. Minato thanked the woman quickly and sped after them. Their target had been running blind all day and night. He had to have tired by now, worn thin by desperation and adrenaline. They used the house beside the orchard as cover, and Minato signaled the others to stay back. Creeping silently to the edge of the building, he peered around it into the grove beyond. A heap of a man in a Kanoha uniform lay in the grass beneath the trees, bathed in the dappled light of late afternoon. Sleeping? For a split second he fought down a hard, biting rage. This was the man who had kidnapped and killed countless numbers of his own people. Men, women, children, tiny newborn. Infants. He'd led the best minds of the village in rings for months. Now, at the end, he slept. Everything in his training told him that the easiest, most logical solution was to take advantage of this man's slumber and kill him before he ever woke up. The scroll in his pocket even demanded that he be executed on sight. But men like this didn't deserve to die in their sleep. He deserved to face his punishment, feel the terror of death upon him, know what he'd done, and who would do it to him. 
He looked at Kushina and wondered what she would make of these thoughts of his. One chance, he said to his team softly. No mistakes. They nodded their understanding, faces set and serious. He signaled each of them to find their positions, they would surround the orchard and block every escape route. This man would have nowhere left to run. Once the trap was set, he moved, stepping out from behind the wall to approach the prone figure on the ground. The moss, soft and wet, masked any sound his footsteps might have made. There was a strange, soft hissing noise that grew louder as Minato closed in on him. Some kind of snake. He frowned and came to a stop directly above Kamina. But he wasn't asleep. Eyes wide and staring, his mouth was moving. An unending, hissing stream of whispers issued from his mouth like escaping gas, too fast and quiet to understand. Minato stared. Was the man insane? Hey, he called, gripping his kunai tightly. Time to face the consequences, Kamina. When the mad, muttering man didn't respond, Minato gave his side a hard shove with his foot. Kamina reacted like he'd been injected with a bolt of electricity. He surged to his feet, knives flashing in wild sweeps just inches from Minato's nose. Leave me alone, he cried, eyes bulging. Leave me alone. He turned and fled, but Minato stayed his ground. It was too late for Kamina. The chase was over either way. Kamina lurched towards the orchard fence, reaching out to vault it. A whistle was his only warning before a spray of sunbon rained down on his path driving him. A.I. emerged, twenty more needles between her fingers ready to aim again. Where you going, Kamina? With a half-crazed scream the man slipped in the moss and scrambled away, heading for the west fence. Uncoordinated and scared to death. Was this what a calculating serial killer looked like in the end? Saburu appeared to cut off his escape, flexing the knuckle dusters in his hands. The sight of him alone was enough to send Kamina reeling backward with a terrified yelp to the only escape he had left. And that was where he met Kushina, standing firm with only her umbrella. He faltered, perhaps knowing instinctively that here was an individual even more formidable than the enormous man behind him. But it didn't stop him. Only insanity or ignorance would have made a man run at Uzumaki Kushina with a knife, screaming that he would end her. Kushina didn't blink. She didn't even move. When Kamina was just feet. Away from her and lifting his arm to strike, only then did she trouble herself to react. The umbrella snapped open between them like an impenetrable shield of rainbows. Minato heard Kamina cry out as he collided against it and Kushina gave him a great shove, jabbing the steel-capped tip of the umbrella painfully in the man's stomach. Just as quickly, the umbrella snapped shut again, revealing Kushina's grim face. Kamina didn't stand a chance. Before he could recover from being winded, Kushina swung the umbrella again in a wide, heavy arc, slamming it bluntly against the side of his head. Kamina dropped like a doll. The knife bounced away in the grass. Around them, birds snapped their beaks shut in fright as leaves and branches parted ways with the trees and fell to earth, split by the cutting force of Kushina's swing. Minato relaxed his grip on his throwing knife without ever realizing he'd reached for it. The last time he'd seen Kushina fight was as a child, and it was safe to say, she'd improved since then. No wonder Ren had fallen in love with her during the war. There was something strangely charming about watching a girl beat a man into submission with her brawly, although perhaps that was just how Minato felt about anything concerning Kushina. She wouldn't kill Kamina though. She'd pin the stunned lunatic to the ground with her foot, but she would leave the dirty business to someone else. The kunai settled comfortably in Minato's hand. He strode over, ready to end the man's life in one quick stroke. He wasn't cruel, after all. Kushina saw him approaching and the frown knitting her brow deepened. Minato. The moment he was within reach he crouched swiftly, grabbing Kamina's hair to pull his head back and expose his throat. Kushina jerked, thrusting the umbrella between him and his victim. Minato, wait! 
Minato stilled and looked up at her blankly. He might have loved her, but that didn't mean he appreciated her interfering in the mission. Not yet, she said. We need answers. That's not part of the mission, he informed her. Have a heart, Minato, she cried. Where are his victims? Ask him. A.I. was jogging over with Saburu. What's going on? What's her problem now? They're dead, Minato reminded Kushina patiently. There's no poi, don't you dare tell me there's no point, she snarled at him. Their bodies don't deserve to be lost and forgotten. No more mass graves. We find those people, and we give them back to the people who love them so they can be buried with dignity. With respect. At once he knew why it bothered her so much. He understood, but. You're letting your feelings about your mother get in the way of your work, he said quietly. Four things happened then in quick succession. Saburu tugged on A.I.'s sleeve, gesturing something urgent to her the same moment Kushina's hand whipped out and clapped Minato around the head like a cat to its kitten, a small sting that was a fraction of the hurt she felt. Before Minato could react, Kamina recovered from the stunning blow she'd landed on him, saw his attacker and lashed out wildly, ramming his fist into her nose. Minato swiftly smashed the heel of his kunai against the man's face, cracking two teeth. When he looked up he saw Kushina wheeling away silently, hand clutched over her nose but unable to stem the alarming amount of blood that leaked between her fingers. Saburu, he called, nodding to Kushina. He wanted to attend her himself, but there was no way he was letting this dangerous killer up and Saburu was the only one of the four with any medical jutsu. A.I., help me restrain him. She obliged, kneeling on one of Kamina's hands while Minato pinned the other. What are you going to do? she asked. Make an inquiry, he muttered, grabbing Kamina around his bloodied jaw. So how about it? Where are they, Kamina? Where are the people you killed? Kamina snorted and gurgled blood. Not going back, not going back. A.I. looked deeply unimpressed with the direction this mission had taken. Just kill him already. Where are their bodies? Minato persisted. Kamina's response was to screw up his face and begin to cry. Well, that was informative, A.I. sighed. He's insane, Minato observed. Some might feel that was stating the obvious, but the fact troubled him. He found it hard to believe such a mess of a man could ever have managed to do what this mission scroll claimed. Or he's under a genjutsu, said A.I. Minato turned to her astonished. What did you say? Saburu seems to think so anyway, jerking her chin at their large teammate. He thinks you broke it when you first touched him with your foot, but it's still messing him up in the head maybe. Bad genjutsu can do that to you, even when it's over. Why would he be under a genjutsu, he wondered aloud. Beats me. Maybe someone managed to put it on him when he fled the village? What does it matter, though? Just kill him. A.I. was right. It probably didn't matter, and he really ought to conclude the mission now before anyone else got a bloodied nose or worse, but Minato found his gaze straying back to where Kushina stood with Saburu, insisting that she was fine. She'd told him to have a heart. Well, he had one thank you very much, but he understood her meaning. And perhaps there was merit in pausing to understand a situation before taking actions that could not be undone. Minato turned back to Kamina, giving the man a firm shake to try and snap him out of his pitiful sniveling. Where are they, Kamina? Where are the bodies? Kamina shook his head, his choking sobs growing harder. Please let me go, I'll do anything. I can make you a deal, Minato lied. Tell me where they are, and I'll let you live. No, please. Kamina gasped. Please, kill me. I just want it to be over. A.I. rolled her eyes. Well, he is asking for it. And it was a strange request for a man who'd run so far and hard. However, if death was what he sought, Minato could provide it. 
First you have to tell me where they are, he said steadily. The strangled sobs began to subside. Underground, Kamina wheezed stiffly. They're still screaming. An unpleasant chill made Minato's skin crawl. Screaming, are they still alive? Kamina whimpered. Not all of them. Minato yanked hard on his hair. Where? he demanded. Where are they? It was underground. I can't stop them screaming. No one hears. I can't. I see ch. In his effort to speak, Kamina was turning red. And not just red, he was turning purple. A.I. looked uncertainly between him and Minato. What's going on? Minato pressed his fingers to Kamina's throat. His heart's racing, he muttered. He's going into arrest. Saburu. First aid over here, please. As their larger teammate returned, A.I. stared incredulously at Minato. You're joking. Let him die. He as good as confessed. You heard him, A.I. If the victims are still alive, we need to find them and he is the only one who knows. She blanched. But the mission, the mission is off, Minato said shortly. Saburu, can you do anything? The silent giant crouched down and pressed a hand over Kamina's fluttering chest. It only took him a moment before he was shaking his head and withdrawing. Perhaps a fully trained medic Neen might have been able to do something, but this was beyond Saburu's limited abilities. Not even CPR. Minato asked a little desperately. Saburu shook his head again and pointed to something on Kamina's arm which was pinned beneath A.I.'s knee. They all leaned close to look. What is that? A.I. demanded, standing up sharply, for she was not a big fan of sitting on things she didn't understand. Minato grabbed the limb, staring hard at Fiery Mark crawling across the flesh of Kamina's inner arm. That's a suicide jutsu, he whispered. At that very moment Kamina's laboring breaths ceased and his body shuddered into stillness. The silence was palpable. Minato checked for a pulse, even though he knew it would be no good. Suicide Jutsu couldn't be stopped or reversed once activated. A.I. stared at Kamina in outrage, what the hell? What was someone like him doing with a suicide Jutsu? Minato sat back, suddenly tired. That old, Familiar sense of futility was threatening to engulf him. He never could seem to get this mission right, could he? I heard sometimes the other Jonin use them in the war, it's so that if you're ever captured, it'll activate and kill you before you give up any secrets. Oh, good, ranted A.I., throwing her hands up. Nice to see we wasted our time. And stone times, lisped a nasal voice that Minato had almost forgotten, Ninja us thee them on others th to fork them into secrecy against their will on pain of death. Ow. Behind them Kushina had found a seat on an overturned wheelbarrow, still clutching her bloody nose with her head back as far as it would go. Minato quickly jumped to his feet and hurried to her side. R. You okay? he asked at last. Do I look okay? asked the girl whose aqua blue tunic had been turned largely brown by blood. Has it stopped bleeding yet? No, she said sulkily. Minato rummaged though his pouches for a handkerchief. Here, he said, holding it out. She narrowed her eyes dubiously. It's clean, he promised, easy her red encrusted hand away from her face to replace it with the soft cotton cloth. He held it there as gently as possible while his other hand slipped through her silken lava tresses to lightly cradle the back of her head. A small, guilty pleasure. Kushina frowned slightly at such familiar handling, but Minato was too busy examining her reddened nose to notice what his errant hands were up to. He gave a sympathetic wince. Looks broken, Kushina. How embarrassing, she sighed. You stave a guy sth life and that's how he repaced you. Yeah, well. I think you may have done the right thing, he admitted. Thank you. Her whirlpool blue-green eyes locked with his steadily. And you, she returned. You too. 
For all the good it did, he sighed bleakly, looking back at the purple, mottled corpse that A.I. was poking with her toe. We destroy the body, right? A.I. called. I think we should take it back with us, Minato called back. In one piece. A.I. gave him a flat look of disgust. You're just not happy unless you've violated every letter of the mission, huh? Minato shrugged. He turned back to Kushina. Will you be okay? She flicked her eyes skyward. Good grief, she sighed, chasing his hands away with her own. It is th only a broken nose though. What do you want to do? Carry me home? Honestly, Minato would have done so in a heartbeat if he thought she'd let him. They arrived back at Kanoha's gates in the early hours of the morning. A.I. and Saburu, the latter carrying a discreetly wrapped bundle over his shoulder that might have been a carpet if you didn't look too closely, parted ways to deliver their target to the high-security morgue to be picked over by specialists. In a situation like this, Minato would be expected to report straight to Orochimaru. There was, however, a slightly more urgent matter to attend to, Kushina's beautiful nose was broken, and Minato could not rest until he'd found the best medic in the village to fix it. I'm fine, I'll just go to the hospital. Kushina protested. She still looked an alarming sight. The blood had stopped flowing, but it still crusted her face and hands and covered most of her vest. The hospital is full of quacks who can't even write in straight lines, Minato informed her. You are not going to them. You'll have a wonky nose forever. I don't care, she insisted. Wonky noses have character, don't they? I like, M. Yes, you could have the wonkiest nose in the village and you'd still put every other girl to shame. All right, no need to be sarcastic, she grumbled, mistaking what he felt had been a very sincere statement. I'm just saying, I don't mind. Going to the hospital. Well, tough. You're going to Tsunadesima. Not her. Kushina quailed, coming to a full stop in the middle of the street. She'll break my leg as payment. She's not that bad, he promised. She's my sensei's teammate. She'll help you. She's terrifying. So are you. You should get on great together. Kushina huffed. Maybe I should break your nose, she asked menacingly. He smiled. See? Terrifying. Having spent many a day in his youth helping his sensei stake out his teammate's house, Minato sadly knew exactly where Tsunade lived. He wondered if it was even a good idea to knock on her door at eight in the morning. If she was still in bed and didn't like being woken up, they definitely would leave with broken legs. And broken arms. And fractured skulls. But Kushina's nose was worth any injury or loss of limb. Still, he was pretty surprised and relieved when it wasn't Tsunade who opened the door to them, but Jiraiya. Sensei, he exclaimed. What are you doing here? Ah, Minato, Jiraiya offered him a thin smile that was cold and perfunctory. Minato had never seen it before. Do you need something? Um. He gestured towards Kushina, who had positioned herself well back from the door, presumably so that if Tsunade had decided to devour one of them, Minato was the more immediate target. Kushina's injured. I was hoping Tsunadesima might heal her. I'm fine really, though, Kushina said. Jiraiya glanced at her mess of a nose, rather short on cheesy chat-up lines this morning. Perhaps now isn't a good time, he said. The hospital will be open. Is everything all right? Minato asked. Jiraiya, called a voice further in the house. Who is it? Just Minato. Tsunade appeared in the doorway beside her teammate, and Minato almost took a step back in shock. Once upon a time, Minato had thought the thousand-yard stare was some trite expression that only existed in the fiction books from the library. Then he'd gone to war and he'd learned what it meant to look into the faces of men and women who had seen too much and had begun to shut down. There was no way three words could do justice to the condition someone was left in when their mind fled its mortal shell. 
He'd hoped he would never have to see it again, and certainly not in a great Sanin as she looked out onto her porch and saw neither him nor Kushina. Minato knew immediately something awful had happened. If it wasn't her suddenly aged face that told of it, one might also notice she was wearing the same clothes she had left the village in two days ago, and how they were now drenched in old, dried blood. What is it? she asked heavily, her unfocused gaze passing between the two youths and lingering with visible discomfort on the blood staining Kushina's face and hands. We were just wondering if you could fix Kushina's nose. Minato said, though he had already realized she wouldn't. Couldn't. Tsunade was shaking her head, retreating. Indoors. No. No. Go away. I am done with this. Jiraiya hovered, looking torn between shutting the door in their faces and explaining. Dan passed away, he said, a startling passive way of putting it given how much of his blood Tsunade was wearing. I've spent the last four hours trying to convince her to shower, so you'll have to excuse us. You should go to the hospital. The door snapped shut in his face before Minato could recover enough from his shock to recite the same old apologies one was expected to give upon hearing such news. He turned slowly to Kushina who stood with a hand clasped to her mouth. That's awful, she whispered. They were going to get married soon, they were going to have children. That's too cruel, Minato. That's way too cruel. Moisture was gathering in her eyes. He could see she was close to tears. He reached out to take her hand. It's okay. She saw it coming and demurred excellently, managing to slip out of his reach without even appearing to do so consciously. I think I'll make my own way to the hospital, she said, looking away from him. Maybe you should go report to Orochimaru? Right. Minato got the feeling that in the last ten seconds he had somehow managed to offend her. He was pretty used to that feeling, however. I'll see you around. They parted ways, subdued and introspective. Minato wondered if Kushina would be okay on her own, though he knew that she was usually far more capable about these things than him. But it was Tsunade's look that haunted him as he made his way towards Orochimaru's laboratory. It was like she had lost everything. Was it ever possible that one person could ever mean that much to another? When Minato thought about how he would feel if he lost someone he loved, Jiraiya, or Kushina, he felt nothing. That was a pain he couldn't fathom. Yet after seeing it in Tsunade's face, Minato was uncomfortably aware of the mortality of their profession. Death struck blindly and without warning. There was rarely time to ready yourself or prepare for loss. One death could create a world of pain for the one left behind, and Minato hoped never to experience that. It did, however, make him understand a little more about why Kushina had challenged him so strongly on their mission. She knew that pain. She'd lost her mother and her whole village, and it still hurt her. She knew that each one of those victims of the serial killer was someone else's devastation. So when Minato went to Orochimaru, it was not to dust off his hands and say, mission accomplished. Kamina may have been dead, but the matter was far from being over. Orochimaru greeted him at the entrance of his lab with the characteristic smile that never seemed to leave his face. Back already, I see, he murmured softly. Is Kamina dead? Minato nodded. The Hokage will be pleased. Orochimaru bowed low and turned to go back inside. It's not that simple, Minato interrupted, making him pause. We caught up to Kamina, but... We didn't kill him. Orochimaru's fixed smile never slipped, but his eyes narrowed contemplatively on Minato. Your orders were to execute him on sight. I decided to question him first. Did you now? Orochimaru stepped away from the door to stand on the step above Minato. He'd always been a tall man, but now Minato's neck risked getting a crick. I thought it would be prudent to find out where he left his victims. But when we were questioning him, it triggered a suicide jutsu. He died. We brought his body back for autopsy. You were supposed to destroy it, Orochimaru reminded him delicately, 
his tone as clear and cutting as glass. There were too many anomalies, Minato explained, his scalp crawling with the way the Sanin was looking at him. He was under a genjutsu when we found him, and it's highly unlikely a chunin of his level would know a suicide jutsu of that class. Also, he told us. Orochimaru's head moved sharply. What did he tell you? Are you sure all the victims are dead? Perfectly. Kamina seemed to think some were still alive. If that's true, we need to find them. Orochimaru leaned in so close Minato could feel his breath fan across his face. It didn't smell unpleasant. It didn't smell of anything at all, really. The man was insane, he said. And you're forgetting there is no we. This is my mission, Minatakun, I merely contracted your abilities for a short while because I had it under good authority that you were efficient and obedient and would bring this matter to a swift and clean conclusion. But since I now understand your talents have been exaggerated, I don't think I shall be using you again. I'm just telling you what I heard, Minato said, growing hot with indignance. None of it seems to add up. I'm not even sure we had the right guy. One thin, black eyebrow arched in scorn. You're doubting me? It's just that the last time I thought I had the guy, it turned out all I had caught was a puppet. What if Kamina is the same? What if he wasn't the killer? He was just another victim? You've been out of the loop for a while, boy, Orochimaru said with a light sneer. All the evidence pointed to Kamina and my investigation was meticulous. Your swaggering bravado will not work with me, but if you feel I've made an oversight, please feel free to take it up with the Hokage. He has more patience than I to explain adult matters to ignorant children. Perhaps I will, Minato said through partially clenched teeth. Well then, Orochimaru began to turn again. Minato lifted his chin. What about our deal? And which one would that be, mused the Sanin. About, my father. I told you I would need your blood for that, said Orochimaru, looking at him closely. Are you willing? Minato nodded slowly. Then hold out your arm. Here. Minato looked around. They were still on the street here. Where else? When Minato proved slow in offering his arm, Orochimaru seized it and jerked him. Forward. He produced something from his pocket, but Minato didn't get a good look at it before it had been stabbed right through the cloth of his sleeve, through his skin and into his vein. Ah, he cried, from the shock more than the pain. What was that man doing carrying needles around on his person? He didn't just look like a vampire. He was a vampire. Hush. Orochimaru whipped his hand away almost as quickly, disappearing a small tube of blood into his pouch. I shall get back to you soon, perhaps. Don't hold out too much hope. You bear a remarkably strong resemblance to a carpet salesman that once visited the village about eighteen years ago. Oh God! Minato clenched a hand over his punctured arm and the growing stain of blood. Could I have a bandage or something? For the second time that morning, a door was soundly slammed in his face. Kushina proved to be a remarkably fast healer. Even the doctors and medics who had once expressed shock at Minato's rapid improvement in the past were left further staggered that Kushina's broken nose could fix itself in just a couple of days without even any residual bruising. As usual, Kushina was a little uncomfortable when people made a fuss of her, she was not interested that the medic Neen believed her rate of cellular regeneration defied all laws of nature and required further study. She brushed off any amazement bestowed upon her like an unwelcome sales pitch, and Minato didn't care either, he was just glad that her nose was as pretty as it always had been. All in all, for their first mission together it hadn't turned out too badly, though in other ways it had proved to be disappointing. There was no further word from Orochimaru about the investigation Minato had called into question. As far as the Hokage was concerned, there had been no further deaths and the evidence against Kamina, the man severely addled by one hell of a powerful genjutsu and killed by a suicide jutsu above his abilities, was absolute. The matter was closed. 
Minato was praised for catching the killer and his repeated insistence that the village should continue to search for the victims were brushed off. Their case slipped down the list of village priorities by the day, as every day that passed made it less and less likely there could be any survivors. Nor was there any word about the arrangement Minato had made with Orochimaru. Though Minato had offered his blood for the express wish of finding a paternal match, the pasty-faced Sanin had never gotten back to him. How long did it take to run such tests? A week? A month? Three? Minato patiently waited, but nothing happened. Eventually he grudgingly accepted that Orochimaru had either forgotten or had been unsuccessful, and since he still wasn't sure he wanted to know his parentage, he didn't bother to approach him again. He would let sleeping dogs lie. Having gone through most of his life untroubled by thoughts of who his father might be, he reckoned he would. Continue to cope. Sure, he may have had the odd little fantasy when he was a boy feeling particularly disenchanted with the caretaker fate had assigned him. Sometimes he may have dreamed that his father, perhaps a Kage or someone equally powerful and important, would show up one day to take him away. So it was probably a good thing his father remained unknown. Anyone less than a Kage at this point, which was certainly bound to be the case, wouldn't measure up to his childhood fantasies. But this was not the primary source of Minato's concerns right then. That autumn several changes came over Kanoha. There were the natural ones, like the increasingly chilly days and the metamorphosis of the trees and forests in and around the village that almost overnight turned from green to every shade of red and gold. Kushina bought a scarf the same shade of turquoise as her remarkable eyes, and once again Minato was reminded of how far she'd come since she was a child. To see her in her dash to the shops for milk in her stylish scarf and hat would make anyone think the grubby redhead who had arrived in the village almost ten years ago must have been some other girl. Then there were the unwelcome changes. Autumn was also the time of year when the genin were due to graduate, and when that happened they would need to be assigned a jonin teacher and subsequently tested. Minato always wished to be spared the process, but sometimes there simply weren't enough volunteers among jonin to turn to teaching. Every year it was always touch and go of who the Hokage would choose to conscript. And sometimes there was a fair bit of kicking and screaming involved. Not just from the children. And that year, Enoichi had it under good authority from a nameless source that Minato's name was being tossed around as a candidate. But this wasn't the only unpleasant prospect Minato heard his name connected to. There was also the matter of some new exchange programs popping up between the villages. During peacetime there were always little token gestures of goodwill between former enemies, and the latest fad was apparently to swap one or two jonin for a few months. The purpose, the official pamphlet read, was to promote better cultural understandings between the villages, and jonin who were exchanged were encouraged to learn and immerse themselves so that their experiences would enrich their own villages upon return. It was all quite pointless. Minato couldn't see the benefits for espionage at all. Better to go undercover and learn genuinely helpful things than go as part of some official program and have everyone watch every move you made and filter everything you might see and learn. There wasn't a village that didn't already have half a dozen spies in every other village anyway, so fully immersed in cultural understanding that they were indistinguishable from the locals. Official exchanges were just too troublesome. Minato would rather not be the one sent over to a former enemy's stronghold where even he would be utterly vulnerable, yet Shikaku was the one to tell him that, as Minato was one of Kanoha's youngest and most impressive jonin of their generation, the Hokage would want to send him abroad to show him off. There was one other change that came to them that season that affected them on a most personal level. In their profession they had to come to terms with the fact that death struck often, and fast, and without warning, but never had they expected it to strike one so close to them, and to one so vulnerable. The day had started typically enough. Minato was working on one of many unfinished reports, and Mikoto had popped round for girl time with Kushina. I always get the pain the day before. I swear it never used to hurt this much. When I was eight, it was fine. 
Mikoto touched her tongue to the corner of her mouth as she leant over Kushina's hand with a tiny bottle of nail polish. 8. Kushina watched her work carefully. That's when mine started. It was way easier to deal with back then. That's so young. It surprised everyone. My mother thought she had plenty of time before I needed the talk, so when it happened I just assumed I was dying. When did yours start? Kushina flapped her hand to dry the blue polish and replied, right before the Chunin exam. I remember I had to forfeit. Did you freak out like I did? What did you do? I started writing my will, just to make sure everyone understood my horrible brother wasn't going to get my stuff. Then I grabbed a bouquet and went to bed in my best dress so that when they found my body in the morning, I'd at least look respectable. Then my grandmother found me and we had to hold this family party the next day to celebrate me entering womanhood. It was pretty traumatic. Well, the center never told me about that stuff. But I remember my mother talking about it, and sensei's wife recognized my cramps before I did. Apart from the pain, it never worried me. The pain is the worst, mostly because Fugaku keeps giving me grief over hormones. Well, I think he'd be moody too if he felt like a savage, wild animal was periodically trying to claw its way out of his belly. Do you ever get that feeling? Kushina swallowed. Some. Times. Through the archway in the kitchen, a rather uncomfortable blonde coughed pointedly over his half-written report. Mikoto looked over the back of the settee at him. Maybe we should change the subject? Minato's fine, Kushina said dismissively. He just doesn't like people to forget he's supposed to be the center of attention. If you like I can paint your nails too, Mikoto offered to him, waving a bright red bottle of polish. He prefers pink, Kushina informed her. Mikoto shrugged. Sorry, fresh out. It's not a good color for girls with our complexion, but come to think of it, it does go rather well with blue-eyed bubblegum blondes. I'll remember to bring some next time. That's not necessary. Thank you, Minato sighed, tugging just a little bit desperately on his hair. Reports were hard enough to write as it was, he'd never been particularly good at articulating himself, and as a Jonan people expected him to do it a lot, and it didn't help when two girls insisted on talking about distractedly girly stuff behind him. He would have gone to his room if his desk hadn't been permanently buried under previous reports and assorted junk since May, so all he had left was the kitchen table. He works hard, doesn't he? Mikoto went on, as if Minato couldn't hear them, and apparently unaware that all he'd written in the last half hour was one sentence that scorned all notions of grammar. If he's not careful, he'll burn out. Geniuses are like that. Kushina was the only witness to the fact that Minato vegged out in front of the TV more often than not, so she made a distinctly contradictory sound. He's fine, she said again. Ren's the one I'm worried about. Minato propped his chin in his palm and glowered vaguely in the direction of the fridge. Going from womanly matters to boyfriends was not an improvement in the conversation, in his opinion. This was always the problem when Kushina got together with Mikoto, since for some reason Kushina usually avoided talking about Ren to him, it all came out in the company of a fellow female. What's wrong with Ren? Mikoto asked. Kushina's shoulders jerked up in a puzzled shrug. Wish I knew. He's been kinda weird lately. Asking me out all the time, asking what I'm doing, where I'm going. He was determined to hang out here today until I said that I planned to hang with you. He wants to spend time with you, Mikoto said. Count yourself lucky. I hardly see Fugaku. Yeah, but I don't get the feeling he wants to spend time with me because he wants to be with me. He just seems kind of annoyed if he doesn't know where I am or where I've been. Kushin aside. Can you do my toes? Put your feet up, don't get any on the sofa, I'll put a magazine down, don't worry. Minato heard the crackle of paper as Mikoto spread out one of the perfect gardener magazines over the cushions. He wished they both cared less about toenails and more about Kushina's much more interesting comment about Ren, 
and for a few seconds he thought it would be forgotten until Makoto settled down and began painting again. That does sound a bit possessive, she said lightly. Some guys can be like that. You don't find it flattering? It's annoying, Kushina said, two words which brought more joy to Minato's heart than she could know. He's only been like this lately, for the last couple of weeks. He started to bug me about moving in with him too. Minato's spine snapped upright. What the? But he knows how hard I've worked on this house. I'm not moving into his messy little apartment. Minato relaxed a fraction, but not by much. A new fear had been seated in his brain. Kushina may not have wanted to move, but what? Was there to stop her kicking him out and moving her boyfriend in instead? Maybe that's your problem then. He could be worried you're not taking the relationship seriously. I'm taking it seriously, Kushina replied stubbornly. He's an older guy, Kushina, Mikoto said as she blew on the other girl's toes, and you've been together a long time. He probably expects things by now. Like what? Like. Have you even slept together yet? The report blurred before Minato's eyes. Had she really said that? He waited for Kushina's response, not daring to breathe. It was a question he'd been wondering to himself for a long time, after all, and he wasn't even sure he wanted to know the answer. Some kind of hissing exchange ensued behind him. It sounded like Kushina had said something in a whisper too quiet for Minato to catch, though Makoto's response was much louder. What? Minato? He doesn't mind, he's a big boy. Isn't that right, Minato? He swallowed. What? He called nonchalantly, pretending he hadn't been eavesdropping on their conversation as if his life depended on it. Mikoto ignored him, concentrating her interrogation on Kushina. It's a normal, healthy part of relationships, she went on. You shouldn't be afraid of intimacy, especially if it's hurting your relationship. Too am not afraid, Kushina said, flicking a nervous glance in Minato's direction. I just don't want to talk about it with big ears over there. What? Minato said vaguely, trying and failing to sound like he didn't care what they were discussing. You don't mind, do you? Mikoto asked innocently as only a married woman could about such a matter. And not at all, he stammered, unnerved by those earnest black eyes. Hey, Kushina cried angrily at him. You wouldn't like it if she was interrogating you over your love life. Well, that was an easy one. I don't have a love life, he said virtuously. I am an unplucked blossom. That's not what Yoshino says, Mikoto told him. He had heard what his former girlfriend had said about him, and considering the reasons they had broken up, a lot of it was strangely flattering in that it was totally exaggerated. He tried not to correct anyone about it, however. Yoshino had her pride and if she wanted people to think they'd been torrid lovers instead of like two cold fish in an icebox that was her lookout. The only drawback was that now people suspected him of being a spectacular stud. Or in Kushina's case, a shameless one. Yoshino and I never went all the way, Minato said. And I think that's fine. Great, in fact. If you're not ready, you totally don't have to do it. Ever. Because, you know, just because you're going out with someone doesn't mean they're the one or you have to do things you're not comfortable doing. And if they're pressuring you, you have to dump them immediately. He was looking meaningfully at Kushina as he said this. She must have sensed his poorly disguised lecture for her eyes narrowed on. Him. Well, Mikoto exclaimed, looking astonished. So the village's most exalted lover is a virgin? That's. Surprising. It's always best to wait for the right one to come along, he said sagely. Perhaps, Mikoto said in muted agreement, perhaps considering that she had had no such option. Her husband had been chosen for her. Kushina's eyes narrowed even further. What makes you think Ren isn't the right one? she asked him. Minato gave a one-shouldered shrug. I didn't say that. You inferred it. Did I? 
Minato feigned innocence. You're the one complaining about him stalking you. Doesn't sound like he's the right one to me. He doesn't even sound right in the head. Well, you'd know all about that. Kushina stood abruptly, leaving Mikoto frantically juggling her bottle of nail polish. Excuse me, I think the guinea pigs need feeding. Blue nails flashing, she stomped out the door. Mikoto shot a curious look at Minato who was doing a bad job of contriving blamelessness. You don't approve of Ren, she observed. I don't approve of boyfriends who try to pressure her into things, he rebuked. Mikoto frowned. But that's not what Kushina said. Ren's been very respectful of Kushina's boundaries so far. Even though I think it would be good for her to stop holding him at arm's length, I don't think that's what this is about. In fact, I'm pretty sure the reason he's getting antsy is because of you. Me? Minato raised his hands. What did I do? I don't know. Rumors seem to follow you wherever you go, and after your enlightening speech about Yoshino, I know I can't place much stock in them all, but recently there's been a lot of rumors about you and Kushina. Me and Kushina? He knew he was only parroting her words back at her. That was all the cognizance he was capable of right at that moment. It's only natural, I suppose, she said patiently. You live together, you're close friends and always have been. It's been going around lately that there's more to it than that, and I'm sure Ren is just feeling a little insecure right now, although he really should trust Kushina more. Wait, does Kushina know about these rumors? he asked. Mikoto nodded. We've talked about them. What does she think of them? She hates gossip of all kinds, especially the kind which isn't true. Right. Not at all true. Not even in the slightest. Minato dropped his chin back into his palm. Hey, Mikoto. Mm hmm? Do you really think Ren is the right one for her? he asked. Why not? she responded with a light smile. He's a Jonin, the nephew of the Hokage. He's kind, patient, and very sweet. Not many people give Kushina a chance or bother to understand her. There aren't many men like him. That was all very well and good. But is he the right one? I don't think there is any particular one, Minato. I think if you find someone and you're compatible, that's usually enough. Ren could be very good for her if she just let him in a little more, and stopped giving him reason to worry her heart's not in the relationship. What if her heart isn't in the relationship, he asked, just a touch more hopefully than he should have. Mikoto merely looked as if the thought hadn't occurred to her. Why wouldn't it be? Her previous words returned to him. You think she holds him at arm's length? She does that to everyone, don't you think? Mikoto smiled sweetly. Not to me. Her smile turned incredulously. Especially you. Outrageous. Minato shook his head violently, no way. Don't take it personally. You should know by now the more she cares about someone, the more carefully she treads around them. Minato frowned in confusion. So when you say, especially you. Mikoto's smile was now indecently sly, and he would have loved to know her next words had Kushina not suddenly rushed back into the house, cradling a limp golden shape in her hands. Something's wrong with the flasher, she said, white with distress, he's not breathing right and he won't move. A guinea pig's life was worth exactly 72 Rio in total. Given freely as a gift from Minato's then-girlfriend Yoshino, to end his life peacefully the miniature yellow flash had cost Minato more than a week's wages, because he was the only one foolish enough to have brought money to the vet. Minato thought Inazuka Tsum's brother had overcharged them shamelessly when a hammer might have sufficed, but one look at Kushina's face told him that the rodent, now beyond saving, had won a special place in her heart and was going to get a better end than most of them would or could ever afford. He hoped the other guinea pig was gobbled by the fox before it too decided to bleed his wallet dry. The only possible upside to this was that now Kushina, reeling from the loss of a beloved pet, 
might need a shoulder to cry on or a nice pair of masculine arms to be held in, and for once Ren was nowhere to be seen. Unfortunately, Kushina had never been into hurt and comfort, and for her all her mercy towards the suffering of even the smallest creatures, she was still first and foremost a practical girl. Her biggest concern was not for herself, but for someone else entirely. Kakashi's going to be heartbroken, she said, standing outside the veterinary surgery with a tastefully plain shoebox. She was staring at it morosely. We should tell him. He'll want to be there when we bury him. Which would no doubt it would be a grand send-off, eulogized by the Hokage himself. Minato wished he could be as sincere in grief as Kushina was, but if he hadn't been able to shed tears for his own father, he didn't think it would be appropriate to mourn for one marginally sweet-tempered rodent. Moreover, while he himself might not feel much loss, he knew that to a child this kind of thing could be devastating. Do you think it's a good idea to tell Kakashi? Minato asked her. What do you mean? He shrugged. Kids and death. Are you sure he'll? Understand? Maybe you should just get a new one and hope he doesn't notice. Kushina rolled her eyes. He's five, not an idiot. And he's a genin. A genin outside of wartime, he pointed out. That means something a little different than the kind of genin we used to be. He's never seen death, but he will one day, won't he? You really think we should protect him from the death of a guinea pig when the average ninja takes a life by age 15? How's he going to prepare himself for the future if we shelter him from something like this? Even so, she blew out a conflicted sigh. She tilted her head back to look at him, and her mouth parted open to add something more when her gaze slid past him. At once she saw something that made her straighten and turn remarkably pale. Minato followed her gaze curiously. Approaching them with purpose was an old woman dressed in elaborate clothes and accompanied by a couple of younger women who looked like they could have been some kind of attendants or a lot of browbeaten daughters. How odd. Minato glanced back at Kushina, wondering if she knew the woman, and discovered his red-headed friend had retreated behind him. Not that this fooled the old woman. Kushina, she said, bringing her train to a halt directly before them. After a hefty pause, Kushina ducked into an awkward bow. Baiwa Kasama, she said. Minato snapped around to stare at the old woman again. Biwako? As in, the Hokage's wife? Ren's aunt? You missed your appointment, Biwako said severely. And then Kushina did something very strange, she stuttered. Ememi guinea pig, I did not come for excuses, the Hokage's wife said, fixing a sharp glare on her. You know your responsibilities. Come with me now and we shall say no more about this, and don't you dare let me ever catch you sneaking off again. Kushina wasn't sneaking. Minato had no idea what appointment they were referring to or why Kushina would know Buwako personally at all, but he knew Kushina took responsibilities seriously. She did not sneak. Minato, it's okay, Kushina said quietly not looking at him. Could you deal with the yellow flasher home for me? He dutifully accepted the shoebox as one receiving the ashes of a beloved friend, though the moment Biwako heard his name, her eagle-eyed stare switched onto him. Namike's Minato? Uho. Yes, he asked, feeling doomed. My husband wants to see you as soon as possible, she said. Right, but could I just take, as soon as possible, she repeated, slower and more forcefully. Minato quickly stepped out of her way as she swooped forward, arm out as if to lay it across Kushina's shoulders without actually touching her, shooing the girl into motion, sleeves billowing. Kushina's dismayed face vanished behind her hair, and without a chance to explain, she was spirited away. What on earth was that about? The Hokage's wife was an extremely formidable kunoichi, but what would she want with Kushina? Unless this was something about Ren? Minato's mind began to race to all the scariest conclusions. The Hokage and his wife were, after all, Ren's aunt and uncle, practically his parents in fact since Ren had been an orphan. It wasn't so strange that Kushina would know them, 
but what did the woman mean by an appointment? Was the relationship between Kushina and Ren so serious that these appointments related to marriage services? Clutching the shoebox tightly to his chest and forgetting its contents, Minato did his best not to hyperventilate. To see the Hokage, that was his task. Rodent coffin and all, he began to make his towards the Hokage's tower, and by the time he reached the entrance his head was full of confetti and big white dresses and towering tiered cakes and a laughing Kushina and a smug-faced Ren. Minato had seen some horrors in his time, but this one would haunt his dreams for weeks. Months even. He had to be getting ahead of himself. Kushina would have mentioned if the relationship with Ren was progressing that way, however much she disliked discussing Ren with him in general. Last he'd heard, that very morning, in fact, his dogged coveting of her had begun to irritate, but then again, if the guy was proposing they move in together, perhaps he wasn't that far proposing, period. Earth to Minato. Minato snapped out of his nightmare. Without realizing it he'd arrived in the foyer of the Hokage Tower and AI of all people was standing before him, frowning up at him. Huh, he said intelligently. What's in the box? A dead guinea pig, he explained blankly. Oh. K. She drew back at least a foot. And what are you doing here with a dead pig? I'm here to see the Hokage. About a dead pig? You Jonin are paid too much. Ye, no. Minato shook himself. He couldn't succumb to fear. What are you doing here? Looking for missions, she said, shifting her weight to one leg as she folded her arms. You don't have any you need help with, do you? The last one was pretty whack, but it was fun, I guess. Missions, he repeated, trying to remember his schedule. No, I don't think so. It's been pretty slow lately. Peace time, I said with a sneering nod. What would I give for a decent war to break out right now? Well, that was one way to look at it. So I heard you and Yoshino broke up, I suddenly said. The change of subject threw Minato for another loop. What's that about anyway? Minato tried to formulate a response, but he was still seeing Ren and Kushina joining hands over an altar. I, uh, he searched for some memory of the one named Yoshino. We weren't right for one another. She didn't like you crushing on Kushina? A.I. asked, eyebrows raised like she was testing him. Kushina's my friend, he said, as he always said, and it was true even if what she said was true too. And she's getting pretty serious about Saratobi Run. Which was a truth that churned his guts. A.I. tilted her head. So you don't have a girlfriend? No. And since? When had A.I. ever expressed an interest in who he dated? He guessed this was just her idea of small talk, since it had been so long since they'd talked at all. The mission together had broken the ice that had grown between them in the last few years, though he wouldn't have called it a roaring success at reconnection. Still, they were talking, and neither was shouting or making snide remarks, so this was a vast improvement on the old days. I don't have a boyfriend either, A.I. said. Okay. If she wanted him to express shock, she wasn't going to get it. After a beat of silence, I rolled her eyes. Could you do me a favor, she said, and hold out your box like this? She mimicked holding something off her to her far right, and out of dumb curiosity, Minato obliged, wondering what the point was. It turned out the point was so that A.I. could step forward and kiss him sounding on the lips without a dead animal in the way. Now that was a surprise. All the anguish over imagining Kushina's wedding was suddenly booted out of his brain via the back door. Strangely, he was now more concerned that people were stopping to stare at them than he was with the pressure of the female lips against his own. And, oh hell, was that Hitaki Sakumo walking past, raising an eyebrow at him? Minato leaned back a little, just enough to break the kiss as politely as possible, and then he proceeded to stare at her, assuming she had lost her mind. The shoebox crept back between them as Minato returned it to his chest, holding it there just a little defensively, 
like one might clutch a cross when confronted with a vampire. AI made a sound like she judged the kiss to be mostly adequate. Stepping around him she said, tell me if any cool missions come up, okay? Minato watched her depart, even more baffled by this than the revelation that Kushina knew the elusive wife of the Hokage. Wasn't AI supposed to hate him? Did, did AI actually like him? How awful. A receptionist tapped him on the shoulder, rousing Minato from his shell-shocked state. The Hokage wants to see you, he said. You can go up and wait outside his suite. Minato teetered up the stairs to the top of the tower where he gladly sank into a chair in the waiting area. With the yellow flasher's box resting on the seat beside him, he wondered why girls seemed to only ever want to drive him crazy. While he should have been worrying about what the Hokage had in store for him this time, he was instead worrying if should look out for further molestations from AI in future, or whether he should worry that Ren's intentions had turned more serious than he'd anticipated. He ran a hand through his hair. The Hokage was already meeting with someone, Minato could hear muffled voices from behind the office door. Having come on such short notice he didn't expect to be seen immediately, and so he sat back, prepared to bide his time. Mostly worrying about girls. Then the door flung open. Minato bolted upright the same. Time the Hokage's eyes lit upon him. Ah ha! He sounded inordinately pleased. Speak of the devil, here he is. See? Very reliable. The man he was talking to was none other than Hataki Sakumo. He took one look at Minato with the same expression he'd worn when their gazes met over the top of AI's head in the foyer, and then he turned to the Hokage, slashing the air with his palm. No. Absolutely. Not. I think you're being unreasonable, the Hokage said to him. The two men now appeared to have forgotten Minato was sitting there. No one comes better qualified. He's too young. Jiraiya was the same age. Hokagesima, you know I trust and respect your judgment in most things, but this I cannot consent to. He's a bad influence and a poor role model. Minato wanted to rebut such unwarranted criticism, he just didn't know what he was being criticized for exactly. As far as he could tell, the Hokage had summoned him here to have his character assassinated by a man he had long suspected had never liked him. On the contrary, the Hokage said cheerfully, Minato is a very nice young man with a knack for inspiring the youth of the village. Most people would jump at this kind of opportunity, and if you don't settle on a teacher for your son very soon there'll be the inevitable problems. Bored geniuses are a recipe for destructive behavior. Who better to channel and guide him than someone who understands it from personal experience? Both men looked expectantly at Minato. Then a third person peered around the doorframe, small and darkied, who stared with the unmitigated curiosity and confidence of a child who understood his place in the world and knew exactly how favored he was. Suddenly it was quite clear why he'd been called here. At long last. He had failed to dodge the teaching draft. But instead of being randomly assigned a squad of Academy Fresh Genin as he had expected, he was going to be given the village's latest boy genius, Hitaki Kakashi. Minato slid his gaze back up to Kushina's sensei. The boy he didn't mind, but the father. There must be someone more suitable, Sukumo all but pleaded. The Hokage just chortled blithely, I think you do Minato an injustice. Why don't we all step into my office and see if we can't come to an arrangement? Minato? Seeing as he didn't have much of a choice but to subject himself to even more abuse, Minato sighed and followed the Hokage's beckoning hand. Inside the office he was invited to draw a chair up to the desk beside Sukumo, while Kakashi clambered at once into the Hokage's chair and the Hokage himself consented to standing by the window. It had been a long time since Minato had felt this awkward in the Hokage's presence, and between Kakashi's unrelenting stare and Sukumo's mildly disdainful silence, Minato found himself wishing strongly that Kushina was there to mediate as she always did so well. You know each other already, of course? The Hokage asked. Of course, agreed Hataki. 
Sakumo. He obviously didn't want to be accused of holding contempt for a relative stranger. It was far more reasonable if Minato was a casual acquaintance. And I'm sure you've heard quite a bit about the yellow flash, the Hokage said to Kakashi, bending to speak to him like an old advisor to a child emperor. How do you feel about having Minato here as your teacher? Sakumo shifted in his seat. Hokajesima, he began to object, but his own son cut him off. I'd like it very much, sir. Although distinctly miffed that no one here had yet asked Minato if he was willing to become a teacher, Kakashi's blunt sincerity touched him. Blinking back his surprise, Minato managed a warm smile. A long time ago he'd spent one horribly long summer tutoring Kushina, and if he could handle that, Kakashi couldn't be too difficult. Still, he had the same sinking feeling that his free time was going to be slowly sapped away. And the kid stared at him way too much. With all due respect, it isn't up to Kakashi, said Sakumo. Of course, of course. The Hokage appeared to be distracted by something outside the window. Though Minato tried to see what captivated him so much, he saw nothing out of the ordinary. If you'll both excuse me, just a moment. He stepped out onto the balcony and promptly walked out of sight. In the beat of silence that followed in the office, Minato glanced at Sakumo, Sakumo examined his nails, and Kakashi, naturally, stared at Minato. They gave the Hokage the benefit of the doubt, waiting for him to reappear, but after the long seconds dragged by, they realized they'd been abandoned to sort this out between themselves. A crafty, underhanded trick. But what did one expect from the leading ninja in a village full of crafty, underhanded ninja? Minato shifted self-consciously in his chair, sneaking another sideways peek at the older Jonin who returned his look with one of muted exasperation. Look, I didn't know I was coming here for this, he said defensively to Sakumo, I certainly didn't want to become a teacher. Oh, teaching my son is a bother, is it? he suggested mordantly. No, it would be a pleasure, I'm sure, Namikaze, you're crawling. Minato's mouth snapped shut. Minato could charm almost everyone he met, and he did so on a daily basis without thinking, but it hadn't escaped his notice that Kushina's sensei was not only impervious to this talent but seemed to take offense to it. Nothing he could ever do would please this man, who had always, according to Kushina, suspected him of narcissism and a promiscuous streak, and at the moment Minato was in no position to argue what with having been caught kissing AI of all people downstairs not fifteen minutes ago. Kakashi grew bored and dropped from the Hokage's chair to begin exploring the strange gifts of state from various daimyo and foreign kage around the edges of the office, including one extremely rare cactus that only bloomed once every twenty-five years, he plucked. The budding blossoms off to tear them open and see what color petals they would be, and one priceless writing desk that once belonged to a famous shinobi poet from the earth country, varnished by the wax of a now extinct variety of hybrid bee, which Kakashi idly began scratching his name into. It was testament to how tense the two men were that neither noticed. The girl downstairs, Sakumo began slowly, that was your teammate, wasn't it? AI? She is, yes. Sometimes. Minato compressed a small sigh. He didn't know what he was going to say to her the next time they met, or whether he'd have the balls to invite her along on a mission again. You realize fraternization is against the rules? Yes, but that wasn't fraternization. Sakumo stared at him. Excuse me, he asked, chilly enough that the temperature almost literally dipped, though that could have just been Kakashi opening the office door behind them, fraternization, Minato said, uncomfortably, it's from, fraternal. That would mean I was treating her like a brother. I don't think that counts as brotherly behavior. Sakumo looked at him like the smartass he was. If you did kiss your siblings like that I would worry. Since I have no siblings, I guess we'll never know. Their mildly antagonistic conversation lapsed. Minato looked longing at the balcony, hoping the Hokage would appear soon to rescue him. When he didn't he forced himself to turn back to Kushina's sensei. It's fine if you want someone else to teach Kakashi. 
I really don't have much experience, so I won't take it personally. Sakumo propped his chin in his palm, apparently bored. I'm sure you're talented enough, he said, which was the closest thing to a compliment Minato had ever heard him utter. But don't mind me if I hesitate to open my son to the influence of any student who takes so strongly after Jiraiya. What does that mean? Minato demanded. It'll be no good if you spend more time chasing skirts than teaching Kakashi, or worse influencing him to do the same. I've never. There wasn't a day that went by when Kushina and Kagura weren't at each other's throats and hair over you. Between breaking up fights and trying to console two girls in tears, there wasn't much time left to teach. I know how you affect people. That's not my fault, protested Minato. He'd had no idea that anyone had ever fought over him, certainly not Kushina. Back then she may have wanted to scratch Kagura's eyes out to get her to shut up about him, but she certainly never would have cried over him. Kakashi is an impressionable and sensitive boy, and from what I've seen you're careless with others' feelings which strikes me as a sign of your immaturity. I'm sure one day you'll be an exemplary teacher, but right now you're still a boy with his priority on girls instead of teaching. Kakashi needs stability and security, not a famous hero to worship, competing with countless others for your attention, Sukumo said, A. Short, damning condemnation that Minato had heard from others as well. Which meant there had to be some element of truth to it. Perhaps the fact he'd never noticed Kagura and Kushina fighting or crying over him was self-evident. You take after your mother in more than just your looks. She was exactly the same. Minato had endured a lifetime of your mother jokes, most of which rolled off his back. Rare was it to find someone who claimed to have known her personally. Rarer still that such a person would insult her memory. I never met her so I'll have to take your word for it, he responded stonily. You don't have to meet your parents to emulate them, said Sukumo. You mimic your father's ninjutsu style closely, after all. Minato was honestly puzzled. His father was a civilian and his knowledge of ninjutsu wouldn't fill a thimble. After a thoughtful pause, Minato looked at him closely. You know who my father is? Of course. Sukumo returned his puzzled frown. You don't? When Minato quite emphatically shook his head, Sukumo sighed. What kind of world are we living in, he remarked, when they don't tell a boy who his parents are. It was hard to tell with Sakumo's insufferably deadpan expression when he was being serious and when he was poking fun, and given the animosity between them this was the latter. If he wanted the satisfaction of making Minato get on his knees to beg for the answer, he would be disappointed. If the greatest mad scientist in Kanoha couldn't find the answer, Hataki Sakumo was unlikely to have been walking around with it in his pocket all this time. So Minato said nothing though he stared hard at the older Jonin in a fashion not unlike his young son. Sakumo blinked slowly and shifted his gaze to the window, then smiled faintly at something he saw, although all that could be seen from this angle was the Hokage mountain and a couple of swallows swooping around for flies. As suddenly and magically as he'd departed, the Hokage reappeared and stepped back into the office. Had he dealt with his business, or had he really just been standing against the wall outside for the last five minutes? Well, he said, clapping his hands. Have we come to a decision? Sukumo sat forward in his chair, exhaling slowly as if about to confess to something with only the greatest reluctance. At that moment Kakashi came running into the office, diving between Sukumo and Minato's chair with a tasteful shoebox in his little hands. Dad, he shouted. The yellow flashers gone all stiff. The great white fang looked at the furry golden brick-like body in the box, at his son's stricken face, at the Hokage who was looking at Minato, and then finally at Minato, the real yellow flash, who was stiff enough to give the guinea pig a run for his money. He was also looking very hard at the wall. No, said Sukumo to the Hokage. Absolutely. Not. Minato leant on his shovel and wiped a little sweat from his brow. He'd finished stamping. Down the lawn as best he could, 
but now there was a mound in the middle of Kushina's verdant little garden that refused to be flattened. At least she would know where to put the headstone, he thought. What a lot of hassle for such a little body. He went back inside to shower, the stink of failure was quite potent today, but before he went back to his room to dress he stopped in the doorway of Kushina's room. She'd left the door open for a change, and he wondered if she might be back. But whatever business the Hokage's wife had absconded her for was turning out to be pretty lengthy. It was close to dinner time and she still hadn't returned. Something Sakumo had said that afternoon returned to him. Was it really true that Kushina had fought over him with his first girlfriend? She'd never liked Kagura much so perhaps she had always taken whatever opportunity that presented itself to throttle her. Minato was sure the feeling had been mutual between them. But what if he'd been the primary source of enmity between them? Then Sakumo had said that they'd cried over him. He knew it was true of Kagura, certainly after he'd tacitly dumped her once he'd understood how antagonistic she was towards Kushina whose friendship he had always seemed to prize above any other. But had Kushina really cried over him? Why? Entering her room was a little like stepping into a forbidden temple reserved only for women. If he was caught he'd be dealt with by the resident goddess in the most horrible manner possible, yet he always enjoyed a healthy dose of satisfaction from taking risks, and now his eyes roamed the room greedily. He loved Kushina, but he knew that didn't mean he always understood her. A lot of things about her left him confused, her unwavering respect for all life to the point of putting herself in danger for the sake of an apparent scumbag nutcase, what had caused her transformation from tomboy to girl who's dressing to bulgro and under the Atof cosmetics, how she knew the Hokage's wife, and just why she got so annoyed when he put his toothbrush in her cup. In his towel, he sat down at her dressing table and stole a little of her hair gel to smooth through his damp locks. It smelled like strawberries, but that was a small price to pay for fabulous volume. There were lipstick marks on this mirror. Minato smiled to himself, to think of Kushina kissing the mirror. Did she do that for practice? He picked up the small tube that might have been responsible for the marks and twisted it. The smell intrigued him most, almost like chocolate. She'd probably taste delicious when kissed. Pity only Ren would know. Minato set it down again and opened her dresser drawer. That was where she kept her diary, he'd had its position memorized for a long time even though he'd never dared open it. But surely a little peek now wouldn't hurt? He glanced over his shoulder to make sure he was truly alone, before unfastening the little lock that was more for show than function. And let it fall open on whatever day it chose. Tuesday 19th, Plumber, 920 Ah he thought with a sense of deflation. It was one of those kinds of diaries. He'd expected a window into Kushina's intimate ponderings, not her to-do list, though it seemed more in keeping with what he knew about her. A girl partially raised in an orphanage where privacy simply didn't exist was probably not in the habit of recording her thoughts in written form for nosy parkers like himself to read. He inched the diary aside to look at some of the papers beneath. Kushina liked to draw sometimes even if her art skills made his look prodigious, and he'd been widely regarded as the worst artist at the academy. They were interesting to look at because of how impossible they were to decipher. Was that a tree or some kind of mushroom? Those two blobs with chicken feet looked like her guinea pigs only because she'd thought to label them. There was a picture of some strange-looking person with yellow hair being crushed with a boulder pushed off a cliff. Hmm. Perhaps she'd drawn that during one of those incidents when he'd left the toilet seat up? The ones towards the bottom of the pile looked especially old, and those he'd never seen before. Not all of them were pictures either. Notes were scattered throughout the pile in her characteristically messy handwriting. When he came across on sheet of stained paper where the writing turned small and neat, he actually grinned. That was his own handwriting. Quickly scanning the contents he realized this was one of the letters he'd written to her during the war when they'd been separated on two different fronts. In this one he was telling her about his broken arm. He only vaguely recalled that event, but reading about it suddenly brought it all back, cracking the trick to heration, falling, 
being sold out to an assassin posing as a prostitute by one of his own supposed comrades. What a strange week that had been. There were more letters beneath it, and Minato was surprised that she had saved them. It was interesting to read his own words from years before and only now begin to remember the things and the people he had referred to. A lot of those faces from the mist border had simply faded from memory. What are you doing? Minato jumped ever so guiltily. Kushina was standing in the door, scowling at him suspiciously. She'd managed to sneak up on him without making a sound. Not many people could do that. Had she known he was up to no good the moment she'd come in the front door? Are you going through my things? she demanded. And no, I guiltily stuffing papers back into a drawer was surprisingly hard while also clamping a towel firmly around his hips. She strode over, but as she moved around him she paused and did a double take. She'd caught scent of his redolent hair, and she leaned forward to sniff loudly. When she spied the open tube of lipstick on the dresser, she asked, have you been trying on my makeup? No, he protested. I was just going through your things, it's okay, if you want to try some blusher. It might suit you. She brandished a round brush at him, more threateningly than he liked. How about some mascara? And risk her stabbing his eyes out? Minato quickly retreated from the dresser, half expecting her to bowl him out of her room like she normally would. Instead she just sat down, crushing the soft bristle of her brush against her palm, and for all appearances forgot him. No reprimand for rifling through her drawers? Not one admonishment for not being dressed? Something clearly unsettling had happened today, and the death of the yellow flasher didn't cover it. There was no way she would ever accept him in her room without screaming the house down. What did Biwako want? he asked her. She slammed down the brush. You're as bad as run. Where are you going? What are you doing? What did he want? Can't I do one thing without having to explain myself to someone? She growled, raking her hands harshly through her hair. Sure, he said, inching further towards the door. I was just wondering. Well, don't. You wouldn't like it if I bothered you about your day. That wasn't normally true, but since today he had managed to grievously offend her sensei, traumatize one child, be molested by his teammate, and ruin her lawn, he was glad she wasn't going to ask. Sometimes I wish I could just leave, Kushina said, staring dully at her reflection. Frayed hair was falling around her face. This isn't really my village, you know. I had another one once. And I said I'd go back one day to rebuild it and I just keep putting it off. What am I waiting for, anyway? I'm not going to live forever and all I do here is waste time. Minato almost dropped his towel in surprise. You're not thinking of leaving. Kushina paused, as if she'd only begun to consider it right this moment. Then she shrugged. Why not? I don't belong here. Of course you do. And what the hell had brought this on all of a sudden? What did that woman say to you? Nothing, she shouted, which was quite obviously not true. Then why would you suddenly want to leave Kanoha? Why not? Give me one reason to stay. Why just one? How about Ren? Or me, where am I supposed to live if you leave? And what about that guinea pig down there? He just lost his only companion today and he needs you more than ever. Not to mention Kakashi. And even if he doesn't look it, I think your sensei needs you too. And who else is going to talk to Mikoto about all that? Girl stuff? This wasn't the plan, she disputed. I was never supposed to be trapped here, but then you, and Ren, and that drat woman, for once Kushina was rendered speechless with the force of her rage. She seethed and hissed and then snatched up a tiny porcelain cat sitting on the dresser and hurled it at the far wall. Minato moved fast, leaping over her bed to catch it before it became nothing more than a hundred. Tiny shards. As angry as Kushina was, he knew she would regret damaging any of her precious belongings. Stop that, she commanded. 
If I want to smash something, I'll smash it. It's just one more chain shackling me here to this damn village. Minato observed the cat in his hand and frowned. What did Biwako say to you? Beside the dresser, Kushina's face crumpled and she pressed her hands to her forehead. You're not sick, are you? he asked, worried. He knew little about Saratobi Biwako, except that she was one of the foremost medic Nin in the village who had taught more than a few tricks to her husband's student, Tsunade. If Kushina was this distressed by a meeting with her. I'm not sick, Kushina grunted. Haven't you noticed? I'm never sick. It was true he'd never known her to catch a cold, but what did that mean? Okay, but then what? Minato, just leave it, she said tiredly. Go away and put some clothes on or something. He did indeed go away and put some clothes on, but when he returned, Kushina had firmly locked her door and refused to respond to any polite knocks. She'd shut him out, but he hoped that it would prove to be a fleeting tantrum and by tomorrow morning she would be back to her relatively perky self with all thoughts of leaving left behind her like a bad dream. However, the Kushina who sat at the breakfast table the next day was a glum sight, and when he asked if she still wanted to leave the village she gave a solid grunt in the affirmative. All she was apparently lacking was a suitcase. Even Makoto approached him after a while, worried about the ideas their mutual friend was expressing. Genuinely lost as to what could possibly have happened between her and Buwako that would drive her away, Minato tried to pry it out of her but she refused to say. If I tell you, she said. I would have to kill you. That was a joke people in their profession liked to make sometimes. And sometimes it was actually true. Just a phase, he told himself. Perhaps it hadn't worn off overnight, but soon she would realize how hasty she was being, and that rebuilding a village couldn't be done alone, not by one eighteen-year-old girl. There would be plenty of time to talk her down and make her realize she had a life here worth staying for, but then disaster struck. Minato got a letter directly from the administration office. Congratulations. It said, as dread crawled up Minato's spine like tar. You have been selected personally by the Hokage to take part in the volunteer exchange program asterisk with Suna. Along with Hitaki Sakumo, you will be treated to an all-expenses paid trip to the wind country to visit the village hidden in the sand, where you will have the opportunity to relax and immerse yourselves in the local culture, as well as trade knowledge and skills asterisk asterisk with the esteemed shinobi of the sand. Bon voyage. Asterisk participation is mandatory. Report to the administration office to receive an approved list of skills and jutsu you. May impart. Divulgence of any unapproved secrets will result in strict punishment and or death. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to like and subscribe, and don't forget to share this video with your friends. Guys, make sure to help the author by visiting the link in the description. This is Fox Sage, and I'm signing off.